This video is a response to an excerpt from a talk given by Dr. David Belinsky, which appears as Dr. David Belinsky destroys evolution in under five minutes. There are already at least two other very good refutations to this video on YouTube, but I've decided to do one myself for two reasons. The first is that the approach I wish to take is slightly different, and the second is that because the person who put this video up has allowed neither dissenting video responses nor comments on his videos, I believe that it is useful to put up as many refutations as possible in order to increase the chance that people will come across one of them. Firstly, here is a synopsis of the video. Dr. Belinsky begins by saying that a consistent group of people in the scientific community, in particular mathematicians, oppose Darwinian theory. He cites John von Neumann as having hooted at evolution. He then proposes a thought project to parallel whale evolution. He asks what you would have to do from an engineering point of view to change a cow into a whale. He says that we can have some sort of idea of the number of changes such as water resistant skin, new lactation systems and new feeding systems. He says that he stopped counting at 50,000 morphological changes as many of the necessary changes lead to numerous other alterations. He then asks how the design constraints of a new environment would be met and how it would be represented in the fossil record. He asserts that to his mind we should see an enormous plethora of different animals in the fossil record between Ambulocetus and the next step. He then adds that the question of what is directing such evolution also needs to be answered. I personally don't believe that the choice of the cow as a starting point to evolve into a whale was entirely random on Dr. Belinsky's part. I think he specifically chose an animal that was ill-suited to such a change. A cow is a specialist fine-tuned over millions of years to the processing of grass, and so converting it into a fish-eating animal is going to be especially difficult, though not impossible given an evolutionary time scale. At any rate, the example is a bad one. It is like ridiculing the Old Testament on the grounds that Joshua could not have parted the Red Sea with his trumpets. Nobody has claimed that anything like a cow evolved into a whale. What is claimed is that a nimble carnivorous mammal evolved into a whale. Dr. Belinsky's first assertion, that many mathematicians doubt evolution, is largely irrelevant. It is the specialists who understand the evidence. That aside, John von Neumann does have many interesting and detailed ideas on evolution, and so he, in some sense, is important. Embarrassingly for Dr. Belinsky, he was a proponent of evolution. It was John von Neumann who explained how a machine could create another machine more complex than itself, effectively countering a common objection to evolution at the time. Dr. Belinsky's claim that von Neumann hooted at evolution appears to be an utter fabrication. Before examining Dr. Belinsky's argument further, it is worth looking at the evidence for whales having evolved from land dwellers. Obviously, whales have mammalian characteristics, such as lactation, warm blood, a neocortex region of the brain. Aside from being air breathers, there is also some more subtle evidence that whales had ancestors who walked on the land. The fin bones of a whale look more like hand bones than a fish's fin bones. Some cetaceans even have bones in the area where hind limbs grew on their ancestors. And there have been a number of whales and dolphins found with atavistic hind limbs. Also, cetacean spine movement is vertical, like mammalian land creatures, rather than horizontal, like fish. To answer Dr. Blinsky's question of what could drive the process of transforming a land animal into becoming an aquatic one, it is worth going over some basic evolutionary principles. Evolution is driven by two factors, mutation and natural selection. The first factor is at its heart random, while the second is effectively not. Mutation provides the impetus and natural selection controls the direction, and in combination these lead to an increasing level of complexity and creatures highly adapted to their environments. The whale's last entirely land-dwelling ancestor has not been established with certainty, but Pachycetus, which was first identified in 1983, was a land mammal that appears to have hunted for fish. The descendants of Pachycetus, which were better at hunting in water, flourished, and within a couple of million years, Ambulocetus had emerged, which was a crocodile-like animal. As the descendants of Ambulocetus lived in an environment that rewarded spending more time in the water rather than on land, 
Those which had traits which allowed them to survive better in the water were more likely to pass on their genes. But now we come to the centrepiece of Dr. Belinsky's argument, which is the 50,000 morphological changes required to change a cow into a whale. As far as I can tell, his entire argument is that 50,000 is a really big number. Well, I have another really big number. 60 million. That's the number of years since the last common ancestor of cow and whale walked the land. 50,000 changes over 60 million years works out at one change every 1,200 years. We could probably double that as we have to go backwards from the cow 60 million years and then forward again. Let us, however, be extremely generous and say that he is talking about changing a fully land-dwelling animal into a fully aquatic animal with echolocation and filter feeding, and we get down to 40 million years, which works out at 800 years per morphological change. Any evolutionary biologist watching this is going to be having fits because I'm talking in terms of years per morphological change rather than following the path of such changes, which is probably the only way it makes sense to approach it. However, the point here is that even going to extreme lengths to accommodate Dr. Belinsky's argument, we arrive at 800 years for a small morphological change of the scale we have observed in the last 100 years. This is certainly not too high a rate for evolution, especially considering many of these changes will be happening in parallel with each other. Dr. Belinsky then tries one last desperate trick, which is to demand changes from Ambulocetus to the next step. There are two false lines of reasoning he's relying on here. The first is that an animal is either entirely land-dwelling or entirely aquatic. One need only look about today to see many mammals at various stages of water adaptation. Ambulocetus looks like a mammalian crocodile, and there is evidence to suggest it lived a crocodilian lifestyle. So Ambulocetus is already partially adapted to water, certainly more so than a cow, while the later Protocetus is still not fully adapted. Obviously, Dr. Belinsky's 50,000 changes are far in excess of what is needed. The second false line of reasoning is that we will necessarily see every single change as it happens. We should not expect to, nor do we need to. Fossilization is rare, and the situation is further complicated by the fact that the Cetacean line branches off many times into lines that have since become extinct. But we don't need to see every single chain. What we need to see are fossils with a large number of common features, while new changes are added progressively as we move up through the fossil record. So, what does the fossil record show? Well, we mainly have skeletons, so there are some things the fossil record can't show. But we can see plenty in terms of dental morphology, skull morphology, means of locomotion, and even in the amount of salt water ingested. These all show numerous changes occurring slowly and in parallel towards the features we see in modern cetaceans. Furthermore, the location of fossils discovered show that cetaceans first dwelt in freshwater areas, then in protected coastal environments, and then they moved offshore. This is as would be expected by most people who understand evolution, and trumps any spurious argument based on the misuse of figures. Dr. Belinsky uses false methodology and an unrealistic evolutionary pathway to make his argument, but even then, his conclusion collapses the moment it is put in the slightest context. Given this, and his outright lie about von Neumann, the only thing that anybody can reasonably claim that Dr. Belinsky has destroyed in under five minutes is his own credibility.